Indian people to, um, by a vote of the people, they, it had to be like a referendum vote to accept it. And I believe it was two thirds, if I'm not mistaken, Ray. Two thirds of the people had to vote and, and accept it. Now, let me just clarify something. There were constitutions that predated 1934 that the tribes had. Um, and in fact, there are um, some um, tribes such as Navajo who don't have a written constitution today. Um, they operate under the <coughs> tribal code, which is quite extensive. But um, in, in regard to the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act that became the centerpiece for a lot of the organizing of tribes as we know them today. It definitely had to be approved by the vote of the people, and then it had to be approved by the Secretary of the Interior if there were changes but to the, the template. Did to, to approve it first before it went to the Secretary of the Interior? Theoretically. Theoretically. Now, I grew up in New Mexico, so yeah. I'm very familiar with the Navajo. Did they write their own code, or was that kind of handed down to them by the federal government? You know, their government, um, they didn't have a constitution. They still no, don't have a right. written constitution. Their codes are passed by their legislature. They, they and okay. um, they have an interesting um, form of government, but I believe they have 30 delegates to their um, legislature. I keep looking at the uh, professor over here to correct me if I'm wrong. But they, um, they meet more as a general council than some of the other um, tribal councils that are more representative in their, in their views. They certainly have a representative form of government, but they also have some um, uh, interesting ability for more general input into, into the, uh, the laws. Just mention one point, uh, Dan, who, that's a, just a wonderful uh, rendition. One of the things that was odd is John Collier was commissioner, good man in some ways, rather heavy-handed than others. The, the Indians did get the right to vote on the IRA and the constitutions, but they had to vote to opt out. If they did not vote to opt out, they were in. That's right. So Collier said, gee, I don't know if I can put too much democracy in the hands of Indians, only if they affirmatively vote to reject it. The reasons the largest tribe, or one of the largest tribe, Navajo rejected is because on ha it happened in which, during the depth of the depression, the droughts, Mexico, a collier and his sharpshooters went down there and shot more than half of the sheep, of the uh, sheep-loving Navajos, basic cultural uh, feast-based symbol, and were shooting over 60, 70% of, of the sheep to bring in the carrying capacity of the range, didn't sit well with the Navajos. That's why uh, they voted to opt out of the IRA. The other point I want to make is a lot of times, if you hear this today, they'll have a vote and they'll have it on a certain day. And you, do you need a majority vote of the people who happen to vote that day? Um, so I think that there could have been some interesting um, dynamics. dynamics going on in the 30s in terms of um, uh, you know, how, how it was presented. And and how and yeah, how that happened. The Navajo reservation is enormous. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't live close to each other. I mean, it could be hard to get to wherever you have to get the vote. Right. I have a question about the panel as it relates to the writing of Montana's constitution. What if the shoe had been on the other foot and the tribal elders had been asked to put together a constitution for the people of Montana, all the people of Montana? Is there something else you would have included or something well, they would look forward to the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly wouldn't pursue that or to speak to the tribal elders. But uh, it seems to me that one of the things that's changing and uh, one of the things that we think about far too much, and if you read uh, Ben Franklin talking about the Iroquois and their innovations in governance and other folks, one of the things about Americans, one of the great observations of a very famous historian, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, what we'll call the end of the frontier, his argument was that the Americans became Americans because of their encounter with the frontier, with the encounter with Indians. There's a famous uh, character called uh, called uh, Leatherstock, and the story is about how you take an Englishman and you transform him into more Indian than Indians, a woodsman, a fellow that sort. And one of the things about America is what's peculiar about American law, not just you know the Constitution where did it come from, was it Iroquois Confederacy stuff, but 
the character of Americans have a lot more Indian in them than Indians in a sense have American in them. So if you think about that, the contribution of the Indian doesn't need to be confirmed by Article 10 of the Constitution of Montana. It's sort of a fact of life, the reality of how America was created this crucible uh, along the frontier. So that's my thought, is that you have on one paper, but you have the reality of life. I have a slightly different answer. Yeah. Um, I, and I certainly can't speak for the elders, but um, you'll notice in Article 10 that um, the language is specific to unique cultural heritage of American Indians, and I have to look at it because I, I don't speak in citation, um, and the preservation of their cultural integrity. And there's nothing in there that talks about their political class. And, and I think that that's um, a very um, uh, important distinction in terms of Indian people in their political status, which is so incredibly important to tribes today. <coughs> they define their relationship with the federal government very differently because of their political status. And it, it you know, the, uh, the very first part of the Montana Constitution basically does say tribes and feds, you still have your thing going. But especially in the 70s, in the era of self-determination and this general um, attitude that Indians usually have about being anti-state, and I'll just say it, um, I, I, I think that um, there is some, um, I think it would be interesting if um, tribal people had been um, maybe more at the table, maybe there would have been a political, a statement about their political status that uh, affirms <coughs> the importance of their relationship with the federal government, which is unique and different. What do you think of that? To follow up on that question, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think everybody here knows it, but there were no Native Americans who were elected to the Montana Constitutional Convention. In this day and age, that would not be the case because we have a number of native leaders who are legislators, for example, and I can't imagine if we were holding a constitutional convention, we wouldn't see a number of delegates at least run if not elected. So in terms of uh, the other uh, countries you were talking about with constitutional provisions, you know, given the, mod the this provision for Indian education for all came from students who were standing at the door yeah. asking the education uh, committee to include this provision, and someone can talk more about that. But that was the degree of participation there. These other countries that have tried other, uh, other formats for constitution, were they at the door? Were they at the table? Could you tell us more about that? Well, let me just mention something that about a very important point, which I think is missed so many times. Indians are a political class, not a racial class, and that's deeply disputed here in America as it is around the world. Is exactly how you, how, where do you slot? There's a great obsession with classification, especially in law. And uh, where are Indians? And Indians have been slaughtered for better worth into a political class. The reason it's important is because uh, I mentioned confining versus liberating views of constitution. We're sort of in the confining cycle now of thought. And one of the great problems is that a lot of the equal protection provisions which were intended to liberate, for example, African American slaves, now be turning backward you got a case pending called Miller v. Texas, probably not down affirmative action, race-based preferences by a 5-4 vote, if, if not more. Indians were the first class in a reverse discrimination case in which non-Indian job applicants at the Bureau of Indian Affairs won a lawsuit against Indian preference BIA. The Supreme Court, God bless their heart, agreed with the United States, the Solicitor General, saying, they're not a race-based class. The Equal Opportunity Employment Act, which is a, the, the club that they were using to knock down any preference is repealing the BIA policy. That doesn't apply. That's a racial class issue. Indians are a political class. They've got treaty rights. They've always been political. That's a big dispute, as I say, Canada rethinking their constitution, rethinking their relationship. So the answer to your question is, if Indians, uh, participate. And that's why it's very difficult to get Indians to vote. It's very difficult to get Indians to come into the body politic because they don't conceive of themselves in that same participatory way. So I think that's a challenge. Where are Indians at the table? Well, there has to be a reason for Indians being at the table. You have to have a stake. 
you don't have a stake, you're not there. <coughs> and it hasn't been a long time since the Indians have had a stake in the outcomes. So I think Were they at stake in Canada? Were they there in Canada? There's a very long story about how the Indians denied one Indian vote. The one Indian member of Parliament, the one Indian member of Parliament from Manitoba held up Quebec of independence. One vote, he refused to yield. He's like a one man filibuster. <laughs> Quebec is not what they want to be. They're not an independent Francophile nation because of one Indian guy says, we've got to give the same deal to the Indians. Wow. One vote. Yeah. I, I had one comment about participation by Native Americans, and certainly one significant thing at the Constitutional Convention that has made it possible for more Native Americans to be in our legislature is the adoption of single member districts. Sure. Uh, I mean, that just was a huge, huge. Jeff Rains could speak to that, but that was a product of long fought litigation creating. Uh, blocks creating minority. That's uh, part of the Voting Rights Act history of, of Montana that Jack was part of. I will also just add that in terms of Indian participation in state um, entities, it, I, I, I know, I know people who I know well who are legislators who get a lot of crap back home for participating in, sure. in the state in the state system, and I and I. I think that um, getting back to the Montana Constitution, this was a, a beautifully and respectfully um, articulated acknowledgement of Indian people without getting too much into the muddiness that happens um, in, in, in the context of the greater, um, the greater debates about uh, where Indians fit in, in, um, in our multi-tiered, layered, um, governing system. <laughs> Everyone getting tired out or? <laughs> <laughs> so raise that stand. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's so one of, this is something we're going to talk about tomorrow about sovereignty and one of the questions that comes up from the state point is whether the federal government has retained the consent of the governed to the extent it's exceeded its enumerated powers, medical marijuana, other things. Um, and one thing that the Montana Constitution provides is, is it ensures the consent of the governed by putting the Constitution itself up to a popular referendum and allowing for a majority vote to change it. Um, is yet, you know, Dana has talked about because of the relationship of the sovereign Indian nations to the federal government and not feeling like they should be subsumed and certainly not legally being subsumed into the state is is um i guess i want to ask is is the federal government in terms of having power <coughs> and it claims plenary power over the indian nations um legitimate when did it ever get the consent of the governed and hasn't the montana constitution gotten more of the consent of the governed uh, than our u.s constitution has from the indian standpoint Effie, i knew you'd ask a question like this but legitimacy and constitutions don't always go together or <laughs> plenary power and legitimacy don't always go hand in hand so that's kind of an odd question but the best i can say is that I think the reason why the federal government takes the attitude it does towards their native people, the Indians, is because it allowed them to do things. If the Indians were inside 